Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Bill DeMain. He's going to share some stories about Ray Charles. I'll tell you one thing I remember about Ray Charles, because I've been listening to Ray Charles a lot lately, and sadly, I, I, I don't know that I, I can really explain why I feel this way, but I feel with each passing year since Ray's been gone, he's less and less part of the musical conversation. And I don't really know why. I mean, people still, if you say Ray Charles, they know who he was and they know he was a legend, but I feel like he should be more front and center than he is because just the incredible work that he did. But I interviewed him on the phone. And again, it was one of those things, as soon as that voice came on the phone, it was like, like I just kind of got goosebumps because it was, it was Ray Charles. And I also went into it knowing that he could be difficult. Like I had had other journalist friends who'd not had great experiences with him, that he could be very sort of brusque and impatient. What I always look for is like the secret handshake, you know, to get people to sort of know not only that you're a fan, but the, that you've done your listening and your work. And so I immediately started talking to him about Louis Jordan and the Timpani Five and the Nat, the Nat Cole Trio. He immediately said, said, oh, man, he was, you know, I loved Louis Jordan, but especially the Nat Cole Trio. I just wanted to be Nat Cole. And he said, I modeled everything I did early on, you know, even before I signed with Atlantic on the Nat Cole Trio. And he said, I, I got it down where I, you know, I had a guitar player and a bass player. I was singing and playing piano. And I was like, you know, the, the Nat Cole wannabe. And he said, then I got to meet Nat Cole and play for him privately. And he said, Nat Cole did, you know, the, probably the best thing that ever happened to me in my career was that moment because I played for him. And Nat said, you're really good, but it's obviously you're trying to sound like me. And, and I, I think you would really sound like somebody else if you were honest with yourself. So my advice to you is stop trying to imitate me or anybody else. And Ray said it was kind of, it kind of hurt his feelings a little bit. But, but he said when he thought about it, he was like, you know, I could have gone on and on just being like a second rate Nat Cole. But it really helped me just sort of cut ties with trying to imitate and find my own style, you know? So it's beautiful to think of Ray and Nat, I mean, just those giant talents in the same room talking to each other. That had to be diff difficult for Nat to be that honest with him. Yeah, I think so too, especially from what I know about Nat, he was a very gentle person who would not be confrontational, but he obviously sensed that Ray was, you know, you could feel the, the talent, like the, especially in the piano playing and the voice, and he probably wanted to help him do well. And he certainly, I mean, Nat passed in, I guess, 62. So he was around long enough to see Ray start to turn the corner into doing more sort of harder edge gospel R&B stuff. I talk about this, you know, so I have, I have a music history walking tour in Nashville called Walk in Nashville. And I, I focus a lot on how country music evolved and during certain periods, you know, whether it was the Nashville sound or Countrypolitan. But I think something that's often left out of the conversation is the importance of the two records that Ray Charles made in the early 60s, the modern sounds and country and Western music. Because essentially what those records did, they took country and Western songs and dressed them up in more sophisticated arrangements. R&B, swing, jazz with horn charts, substitution chords, different rhythms. And those records sold really well. And they introduced Hank Williams. They introduced Don Gibson, all these country songwriters to audiences that would have never, ever paid attention to hillbilly music. So I think Ray Charles gets left out of the conversation. He deserves so much credit for breaking down barriers and introducing country music to a wider audience. Absolutely. Well, certainly um, Busted, um, I Can't Stop Loving You. Um, the version of I Can't Stop Loving You is about as perfect as music yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, it's just... <laughs> it's amazing to hear Ray Charles sing a simple song and just, like, make it his own. 
you know, and he doesn't even have to do that much vocalization or riffing or, you know, it's, it's just the way he phrases, you know, it's just the sound of his voice, like against, against the piano. The, he was one of a kind, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm sad to see that, you know, I, because I've been getting into Ray Charles again lately. I only have, I have the Atlantic box set and I have a couple of the reissue Rhino things that they did, but all of that great stuff he did for ABC in the 60s after he left Atlantic is out of print. It's impossible to find. And that seems wrong to me. That's one of the th reasons I kind of feel like, wait a minute, this is Ray Charles. You know, this stuff needs to always be, it's not even on streaming services. In the day and age of the resurgence of vinyl, Ray Charles seems like exactly the sort of reissue yeah. that people should probably be putting it out. I agree. But I, I don't know if it's happening. I don't see it happening. I think late in his life, he did a duets record. One of those kind of star-studded, cross-generational things that always doesn't show off the artist best because it's, it's so watered down. It's like, and here's Nora Jones, you know, and here's Bono. And like Sinatra did those too. So I think it was that. Um, he was still in good voice though. I mean, Ray, Ray really, he, he stayed strong pretty much right up until the end. Even, even when his voice lost some of its power, he found a way to make that work for him where it was even more poignant, you know. He was also getting ready to do a Kennedy Center tribute to Quincy Jones, which is something that's on YouTube. It's great. And Ray sings an old Tim Pen Alley song called My Buddy to Quincy. It's just like, even thinking about it makes me want to cry. It's, it's so emotional and so beautiful, you know. But really, I can't, you know, because I haven't gone back. I have the cassette tape of, of our interview, which I treasure, just to hear my voice with Ray Charles on the phone, you know. Now, now you want me to, you want to make me find that tape. Because I, I know we talked for about 30 or 40 minutes. I can, just can't remember what else we talked about. I just remember the Nat Cole stuff because he was so, he was just so animated. Ray had a great laugh, you know. I sometimes think you can tell the way people speak, like the way it relates to their their singing. You know, he had like a like a vocal range when he was speaking, or he would go way up and <laughs> when he would laugh and it would come back down and be grab. Just you know, it's like all part of the music of his voice.